Okay, um, good, good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting in 2015 of the Health and, and Sport Committee. Uh, apologies been received from our convener, uh, Duncan McNeil, who can't be with us the, this morning. I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system. And you will see some of us here using tablet devices. This is instead of hard copies of our papers. Our first item on the agenda today is to take a decision on taking business in private. And I invite the committee to agree the following. Uh, uh, to take the approach to the smoking prohibition children and motor vehicles Scotland bill, the draft report on health inequalities in early years, the committee's response to the fertility treatment evidence sessions and future work programmes all in private at future meetings. Can I get the committee's agreement to do that? Okay, thank you very much. So we move on to agenda item two, subordinate legislation. Uh, and we have five negative instruments before us today. The first instrument is the National Health Service Pension Scheme Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 forward slash 94. There has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the instrument. Uh, the details are in your papers. Can I invite any comments from members? Okay, there being no comments from members. Uh, can I ask if the committee has agreed to make no recommendations? Yes. Okay, that is agreed. Thank you. The second instrument is the National Health Service Pension Scheme Transitional and Consequential Provision of Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-95. Uh, again, there has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the instrument and the details are contained within your papers. Can I invite any comments from members? Okay. There have been uh, no comments from members. Is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? Okay, that is agreed. Thank you. The third instrument is the National Health Service Superannuation Scheme Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015 forward slash 96. Uh, again, there's been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has again drawn the attention of the Parliament to the instrument and the details once more are contained within your papers. In this instance, do members have any comments? Okay. There being no comments, comments, can I ask whether the committee has agreed to make no, me no recommendations? Okay, thank you. That is agreed. The fourth instrument is the Food Scotland Act 2015 Consequential and Transitional Provisions Order 2015 SSI 2015 forward slash 100. Uh, once more, there's been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the instrument and the details, again, are contained within your papers. Can I invite any comments from members in this instance? Okay, there being uh, no comments from members, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? Okay, thank you, that is agreed. We're almost there. Um, the fifth instrument is the National Health Service Clinical Negligence and Other Risks Indemnity Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 forward slash 102. Again, there's been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has in this instance not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, do members have any comments this morning? Okay. There have been no comments from members this morning. Is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? Okay, that is agreed. Thank you. We got there. And uh, once I have some water, I've got a very sore throat this morning. My apologies. We can, yeah, it's a wise decision, uh, Rhoda. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item three on fertility treatment. Okay, so as I said, our main business of the day is to look at fertility services. Last week we heard from the patient groups and today we hear from a selection of NHS boards. So can I ask the committee to welcome Dr Vanessa Kay, consultant in obstetrics and gynaecology, NHS Tayside, Dr Abba Maheshwari, consultant gynaecologist and subspecialist in reproductive medicine and surgery, NHS Grampian, Dr Graham McKenzie, consultant in public health, NHS Lothian, and Helen Lyle, consultant gynaecologist and clinical lead assisted conception unit, Glasgow Royal Infirmary, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, thank you for your attendance this morning. Now, uh, we have agreed to uh, go straight to questions, if uh, witnesses are okay with that. And uh, Colin Keir has informed me he would like to ask the first question. Uh, 
Okay, thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, I suppose it's a degree of parochialism here, being an Edinburgh MSP, that perhaps I can ask Dr Mackenzie uh, the first question. And it's uh, we note from your submission that NHS Lothian and its infertility service have been successful in significantly improving the waiting times for IVF, ICSI since 2009. And really just wondering, in your view, what the main factors are behind this welcome development? Just, sorry. Just, yeah. yeah, thank you for the question. We we had a, a long waiting list back in 2009, and that had accumulated over many years. We put in submissions for extra funding to the uh, to the health board over a period of of two years, and on the second occasion we received that funding, and that funding has has increased since then. And it, I think it's it's partly because we have a a management team that includes representation from strategic planning and from public health, in addition to the traditional management team which has has clinicians and management on it. So we have a person on, on, the, on the management team who is able to understand how the health board's funding processes work, and he's been very successful in, in securing that funding. And I, I, it wasn't a difficult argument to make. We, we had a very long waiting time. And and now we've 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 really reduced that very dramatically. Was there any? Um, well, obviously, in terms of the management, you've looked to come to the decision that you did. <coughs> Excuse me, another one with a sore throat. <laughs> um, was there any um, uh, fundamental changes in the way that you approach the delivery of service? As written in the in the submission, we we did take the opportunity at that point when we had more funding to look at how we how we provided the service. Back in 2010, we were doing the the traditional approach of of providing three cycles of of treatment. And at this point, I think it would be helpful to define what a cycle means. And and at that point, a cycle was implanting. The embryo into the in, into the uterus at, at, at one point. Um, it didn't include all the other cycles that that we now think of as being part of a cycle. We changed the terminology at that point locally to make that clear. So we would discuss we would describe a round a round of treatment, where a round would be everything from the ovarian stimulation through to harvesting the embryos and implanting first the fresh embryo and then sequentially the the frozen embryos. And so at that point. We, th we, we, we did some modelling and we increased the, the chances of a couple having a successful pregnancy um, by, by increasing the, the, the number of, of, of cycles that a couple could have. Is that, is that point clear? Mm -hmm. um, so a round is, is all the way through. It's, it's described in the NICE guideline as a full cycle. Um, Caller, I apologise. I will let you back in. It's just the clarity of, 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 of all the committee members there. Are you saying, Mr McKenzie, that Previously, a cycle was one embryo transfer. Yes, uh, one embryo transfer, yes. And, and now the situation is that if you have a number of embryos, a cycle will be using all those embryos for a number of transfers, if that's what it takes to, to have a, a, a successful that's, pregnancy. That's absolutely right. It, would it be reasonable to ask uh, the, the, the were other witnesses, and I will let you back in, Mr yes. McKenzie, of course, about whether that's the, the same situation across each of the health boards? Yeah, Ms. Lyle. It's, it, 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 um, it's probably better to go back and explain. A cycle of IVF or ICSI is um, where the, the female patient has injections to stimulate the ovaries to produce more eggs. Those eggs are harvested and then are fertilised with the sperm in different ways for IVF and ICSI. Now, traditionally... Um, I think what um, Dr. McKenzie is saying is that one cycle was viewed as the fresh embryo transfer. So in other words, the eggs are harvested, they're fertilised, the embryo is created, and that's what we call a fresh embryo transfer. In some occasions, not all, about 30% of couples would have sufficient embryos of good quality that could be frozen for use in subsequent cycles. Now, we in Glasgow have always regarded a cycle as the fresh embryo transfer and any frozen embryo transfers that have accrued from that one embryo collect one egg collection. Does that make sense? Yes. 
So we've, we've always viewed that as one cycle. But I think what you're saying is that you used to see the fresh cycle, the fresh transfer was one cycle, and the frozen transfers were a different cycle, is what you're saying, isn't that's it? Correct. Yeah. In, in, that's correct. In the past, we used to do two fresh cycles and one frozen cycle. And that, that was the three that, that, that couples were allocated. Okay. Can I ask the other two witnesses? Because it seems as if there was a postcode lottery previously and what, what, what was determined to be a cycle also. Has is, is this now been standardised? Is it the yes. same across each health it's board? It's certainly now standardised, but it was a lottery. We treat patients in, in Tayside from um, Fife and from um, Forth Valley, and each of them had different rules. Um, but now with the National Fertility Group, it's standardised, and so a cycle includes any frozen. And I think that's much better for patients because in the past there was a pressure that some patients would decide to keep the frozen embryos frozen and go for another fresh cycle um, with all the risks involved, including the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation, in order to have two fresh cycles and then pay for the frozen ones. And so I think it is better now. And Dr Maheshwari, is that the same? That's exactly this. Uh, it used to be the same in Grampian as well. And in Grampian, we have we are the tertiary care centre for Grampian, Highland, Orkney, <laughs> as well as Shetland. And all four had different criteria. Some even funded only two cycles, some funded three cycles. So if you were across the road in, in a postcode in Highland, where you come in Grampian area or in Highland area, things were different age group wise. But because of the new criteria, it's all uniform. And one cycle is all embryos related from that cycle and used. So that is very uniform. OK, okay. thank you. Uh, I, it, Dennis, I am going to let you in, but I'm conscious that I, I, I cut my colleague called here off because he was clear and I wasn't clear, which is why I had to ask those follow-up questions. So I will let you in next as a supplementary, Dennis, but Colin here, did you have some follow-up no, questions? No, I think um, uh, let okay. things carry on. Okay, uh, Dennis. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Convener. It was just to clarify from the Grampian perspective, um, <clears throat> are all treatments carried out at the Aberdeen Royal? Aberdeen Fertility Centre, yes. That's right. So patients from Orkney, Shetland, etc., have got to travel. They have to. Are they subsidised in their travel? They are subsidised by the health boards in their travel. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Rosa Grant. Can I ask um, about the third cycle? We took some evidence um, last week about. Um, obviously, the I think the optimum point is to have three cycles if that is um, clinically um, recommended. But there seemed to be a reluctance to move to that third cycle. And can I ask if you're aware of that reluctance and what it might be based on? What? Um, can I, um, I don't think... I mean, reluctance is probably not from the... Uh, from the providing community, as I understand, that National Infertility Group was set up before that some of the health boards were providing, such as Grampian, were providing three cycles. But the waiting list for, was very long, so it was just to equate the waiting list and to bring it down to less than 12 months. This was agreed, and the plan was, as the National Infertility Group, which Dr. Lyle would be able to allude to much better, is to look at the third cycle provision and the other provisions such as having no genetic child in the family as well. So there is no reluctance from our side to provide it. It's just the funding and current criteria is two cycles, but it has to be in the people, in, for couples where there is good chances of success rather than a blanket policy of saying everybody can have it whether there is any uh, good chance of success or not. Would that not be the case with any cycle, though, that if there, if there were issues that would say that a cycle was very unlikely to be successful, you wouldn't go ahead with that cycle, even though someone was entitled, I guess, for want, want of a better phrase. It's always down to a clinical judgment. Absolutely, and this is written in the infertility group guidelines, initial infertility group guidelines, absolutely. Rose, I'm conscious uh, Dr Lyle was, was name-checked. I'm just wondering if you wanted to add to that. My apologies for Yes, I, I would agree with ABBA. Um, I was part of the National Infertility Group, and I, I think there are probably a number of factors here. I'm, uh, like ABBA, not aware of any reluctance um, in terms of provision of extra um, cycles, but I think the whole thing needs to be seen in, in a wider context. When um, the National Infertility Group um, took over two years to reach its conclusions and then um, the report was produced looking at the criteria which achieved equity 
of access for assisted conception treatment in Scotland and also equity in terms of waiting times and that has now been achieved which is something that we're very proud of. I think it's fair to say that any number of additional cycles that you provide to a couple will increase their chances of a pregnancy and ultimately what we all want to do is give couples the best chance of achieving a pregnancy. I mean that's why we do what we do. But I think the factors that come into play here are similar to the factors when the National Infertility Group was convened in the first place. And although it's desirable to provide as many cycles as possible, you have to see that in a context of what is, is possible within the, the wider health service. And at the time of the National Infertility Group, the evidence was very much looking towards the fact that three cycles was the optimum number of cycles. And that may still be the case. But I think what we also need to understand is since 2010, which was when that evidence was, um, was available, the clinical service has moved on very much. And, and that picks up some of the points that, that um, Mr Kerr mentioned earlier, that things have changed in terms of the eligibility criteria. So part of the reason for optimising body mass index, smoking, alcohol consumption, was to improve <laughs> success rates. And that has definitely been seen. Units also now are providing what we call extended embryo culture. So what that means is that we have the facility to keep embryos in culture for longer, up to five days, which means we can get more information about the embryos before we replace them into the woman. And when we get more information, we're better able to identify embryos with the best implantation potential. So that also has increased success rates. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is that because we're getting better at culturing and creating embryos, we're going to have um, more issues around freezing. So we're going to be able to freeze more. Techniques of freezing have improved. The more frozen transfers a patient has, the more resource that's going to take. So I think what I'm saying is it's not an easy answer. Yes, I think everybody would like to see patients receive their best chance, but I think very much that needs to be seen in a wider context of service improvements and also the demands on a service in providing that changed service. What you're saying is that there isn't the capacity in the system at the moment to deal with offering a third as just the norm. I don't know that I don't know that it's right to say there isn't capacity in the system because I think um, there probably is. But what I'm saying is that when you look at the, at the implications of, say, a third cycle, there are going to be staffing implications. There are going to be implications for additional freezing, for additional frozen embryo transfers. But also, the need for that third cycle is going to be different to three years ago because the service has improved. So I think that all needs to be looked at. And also the implications for staffing to provide that. Um, you know, I think the wider picture needs to be considered. You, you seem to be slightly, I'm, I'm maybe picking you up wrong, but you seem to be slightly at cross purposes in that you're saying because the service has improved so mm. much, there seems to be less need of a third cycle on one hand, but also that a third cycle would create a, quite a lot of extra work. Those things seem to be... No, sorry, I, I, I think, no, I mean, if... If you give couples more cycles of treatment, they're going to have more chance of success. But what I'm saying is that the number of couples who perhaps would need a third cycle is different now to, say, three years ago. But whenever, however many third cycles or however many cycles you provide, that is going to generate an increased workload, which will need to be factored into the service provision. It's not saying we shouldn't do it. It's just saying that... It, it, that needs to be part of the consideration. The, the other thing was that when the National Infertility Group um, considered the original criteria, there was always the intention to review the criteria once the waiting times had met, had been met, and that review process has only just started. So that review process is happening, but it has only just started. We always said it would it would be March 2015. And that process, we've had two meetings now to begin that review process. During the third cycle? It would, because uh, as part of that review process, we're um, liaising with colleagues in ISD 
and they're able to generate the data that I've, I've been explaining. So that will help us to understand the impact on the service of, of whatever we provide. Okay, and um, before I'm going to move on to Dennis in a second, I'm just, Dana, or other witnesses have something to, to add to that, or are you content that that kind of represents where you are in terms of capacity and a third cycle in, in your health boards also? about that very well thank you yes. okay um, yeah. agree with that but i um, just to add that nhs grampian has recently inputted more into the reproductive medicine services and instead of four years ago when there used to be only one consultant we have now have got three consultants so they have put it on their agenda as well so we will have capacity to provide extra that's cycles. that's very helpful dr mashwari thank you for that uh, dennis robertson hey, thank you very much convener um the report the National Infertility Report, paragraph 197, is more or less suggesting that three cycles uh, could happen, but it's based on affordability. Um, and it's asking, <coughs> obviously, the uh, the group when it next meets to look at the uh, specifications and the criteria as to moving to that. But I hear what you're saying. Um, and the answers to Rhoda Grant, but a lot of it seems to be based on the affordability for each health board and moving to that third cycle. Would you agree with that? Um, I think inevitably, oh, sorry, was that a question? Yeah, <laughs> it was, sorry. <laughs> um, I think inevitably the question of affordability has to come into it because the impact on the service and how that's going to be delivered has to be considered. With regard to criteria, when we're looking at eligibility, what factors other than BMI, and I, I always find that BMI is a very strange one because uh, there's so many other different factors that can you know, impact on a person's BMI. And obviously I, I look at the, the, the factors of maybe being smoking, alcohol or obesity. Are there any other factors in terms of the eligibility criteria? Dr. Lyle again, maybe? Oh, oh um, you've been name-checked, Dr. Lyle, yes. Um, and then maybe move on. Yeah. Um, well, lifestyle factors. We would always um, discuss general lifestyle factors with couples. We'd also take cognizance of any um, pre-existing health conditions that they have and make sure that we have a, a very close liaison with their um, physicians who are managing those conditions so that for a diabetic would be a good example to make sure that their um, diabetic control is optimal before we start treatment. And, and obviously, the th yeah, I was going to say, obviously, Dennis, the can thing I just check in yeah. case I don't, I don't yeah. know if any of other witnesses want, want to add on to that in terms of criteria yeah. or? Well, there's quite a few So, apart from the BMI, there's the one on smoking, so they both have to be tested as non smokers before their name on the waiting list and before they start treatment. Um, as Helen said, we need to say they're medically suitable for treatment, so we have to look at the obstetric risks, the uh, risk to their health. Um, we have to, under the Human Embryo Authority, look at the welfare of the child issues, that they're going to be good parents. Um, there's age criteria, so they have to be below the age of 42 at time of starting treatment. And if they're over 40, they have to have a good ovarian reserve. Um, and we have to assess there's a reasonable chance of treatment being successful to balance the, the risks, because IVF treatment does have risks involved as well. So there are quite a few different criteria we look at. I may have missed it in the report, and forgive me if I have, um, but there doesn't seem to be a definition with regard to couples or partners. What's your view in terms of what is defined as a couple? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, we treat same-sex couples. Um, we don't treat single people at the moment for fertility on the NHS. Um, they have to be in a stable relationship for at least a year to qualify as a couple. So you, you do treat same-sex couples? We do, yes. And is that across all health boards? It is, yes. yes it is. Okay. Was that um, in the report itself? I, I, as I say, I, I, I may have missed it. But just for clarity, and obviously putting on the record here, um, when we're looking at the definition of couples, um, would it not be advisable uh, to have that in, embedded in the report? Probably go back to Dr. Lyle, you said you're part of the infertility group. Um, we, we do have a definition of a couple, which is a couple living together in a stable relationship for at least two years. 
And we also have a statement that says there is no discrimination on the grounds of race, gender, sexual orientation, or words to that effect. But um, there is wording around that. So that there's, I mean, clearly, the definition of a couple is difficult in terms of, you know, these days, couples maybe don't live together all the time, or, you know, what is a stable relationship? And, and you know, we had a lot of debate about that, but that is the definition we settled on, cohabiting in a stable relationship for at least two years. And it's based on the equalities agenda? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Dr McKenzie wishing to come in on that? Yeah. I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that years ago, we used to have separate um, patient information leaflets for same-sex couples and heterosexual couples, and um, now we've moved away from that. We, we, we treat all couples the same. It's, a, it's the same documentation, it's the same guidance, and I think that's a very positive thing, that um, we, we just, there isn't a distinction. And the, the guidance is obviously uh, out there for the GPs to make that initial referral in the first place, because do you take all your referrals via GPs? The Dr McKenzie first. The, the guidance in Lothian is on the, the REF help system, which is an openly accessible system that people can use across, across um, well, any, any internet user can use it. So a patient can look at it, a GP can look at it. So although it's aimed at, at, at Lothian GPs, every, everyone can look at it. And, and that, that, is, that takes the, the big guidance that you're talking about and turns it into a manageable piece of guidance and a protocol for GPs to use. And, and referrals are through GPs, or or through hospital specialists in some circumstances. Mm. I, I think. Um, is that the same for every board? Thank you. Yeah. 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 Dr. Board. K. Yeah. Yes, it's the same for us. All our referrals are through GPs. Um, they have access to our guidance. We have a website for the cystic conception they can access, so patients and GPs can access. But when the criteria were introduced, all GPs were sent information about that as well. Let's talk, Dr. Maswari. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have guidance for GPs in our intranet as well as on our website. We also do regular GP teachings to update them with the criteria and guidelines, especially when the new guidance came and like they said, we did send them later. And we are the secondary care center as well as the tertiary care center for fertility referrals. So we do a lot of secondary care work as well um, for the assisted conception. And uh, the referrals to secondary care are from GPs as well as the consultant colleagues from Highland, Orkney, Shetland as well. Okay, and Dr. Lyle, yeah, just as much as Dr. Lyle, yeah. just then we'll, we'll, we'll have a full house, Dr. Lyle, is it similar? <laughs> yes. um, we're similar to Aberdeen. We have GP referrals. We also have referrals from the what we call the secondary centres, which are for us Ayrshire, Lanarkshire, Dumfries and Galloway, Highland. Um, because like Aberdeen, we act as the secondary centre for um, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, we've, our guide, guidelines will be on our website and also um, we've done a lot of work recently with GPs locally um, engaging with them to try and streamline the referral process. Thank you very much. Two, two committee colleagues wishing to get in, Dennis, but is it a supplementary on the same theme? Yeah, it's, 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 it's just on, on a, a question of the term infertility. The, the, um, there, are, there is a view that perhaps we should be using a much more positive term, such as fertility, as opposed to infertility. Do you have a view on that in terms of the patients? Is that, is that a much more positive guidance in terms of what we call the clinics? Dr. Mashwara, yes. Ideally, infertility, as you say, is not a very positive term. And in today's world, when there is so much advances in fertility treatment, infertility as such doesn't exist. It's subfertility rather than infertility. And more and more, we are calling our clinics as fertility clinics or reproductive medicine center where these clinics are held, rather than just saying this is the infertility center or whatever. So we have, at least in Aberdeen, we have changed our name to Aberdeen Centre so of Reproductive. Leading the way, yeah? Yes, again. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we have any other witnesses lead, leading the way? <laughs> Assisted conception, is that not yeah, the, the normalised terminology? Do, the Dr McKenzie is hand up first, okay, yes. In, in Edinburgh, it's called the Edinburgh Fertility and Reproductive Endocrine Centre and has been for years. So again, that, that positive oh, okay. fertility, I can't tell you when it started, but uh, uh, using that, that name. I bet I should yeah, check, so but everyone calls themselves Dr. K. <laughs> 
We, we call ourselves the Sister Conception Unit, but I was discussing it this morning um, with my colleague, and I think we still have letters going out to the infertility clinic um, for those coming to the, the secondary level clinic, and I think that's something we need to review. Okay, thank you. Do, 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 Dr Lyle at the GRI. Yeah, we're the Assistant Conception Services Unit, so similar to Dundee. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, th thank you, Dennis. Uh, Richard Lyle. Thank you, um, thank you Gavina. I've sat and listened to Dr. Lyle, same name but uh, different spelling. Um, can I go back to the cost and how many um, cycles we have? And, and the information we're getting is an average of £3,600 per cycle. Um, a number of health boards over the last few years have made significant changes. You've got £12 million from this government to improve it. Um, but some NHS boards are not investing the appropriate amounts in the service. Why can't we move to three? Now, we are getting told by uh, last week by witnesses that basically after two, it's very traumatic for people to go to three. Uh, anyone trying to have a baby, you know, any lady who's going through this must be totally traumatic to, to everyone. So when we get to a situation when we're getting to near three, we're down to, to quite a low number of patients who actually need three. So why isn't it universal in Scotland to have three? I don't think anybody's saying that we can't go to three, not at all, nor is anyone saying that we don't want to go to three. I think all anybody is saying is that we need to understand the implications of that first. In terms of investment, I mean, the other centres can speak as well, but in terms of investment, we were delighted to have the funding from the Scottish Government and that has made a huge difference. Greater Glasgow and Clyde have also invested over £3 million in, in a new unit and we're certainly seeing the effects of that in terms of success rates and just in terms of provision of service to patients. So, you know, certainly in Glasgow the Health Board has very much responded very positively to the Scottish Government um, investment. But I think like everything else in life, you wouldn't just go ahead and do something without understanding the implications of it. It's not at all saying that we don't want to or we can't. It's just saying that, as the, the National Infertility Group promised, before it was implemented, we need to understand what those implications are. And that process has been started off now, as, as it, it was always said it would be, um, with engagement with ISD to gain the relevant data. And once that is understood... Um, a decision can be made. But I don't think anybody could just say, you know, in anything in life, oh yes, we can just do that without fully understanding the implications of it. Well, the implications for any couple is if you can get to, you've done to, but you still, you know, let's be honest about it. You know, people who are in this situation grasp at straws. Mm -hmm. And they get to a situation where it's a very very, very traumatic situation for that couple. So they've been through two, they sit down with their doctor or, or, or yourself and, and say, well, we want to go for free. And someone turns around and says, no, we only do two. Sorry. I think we're talking about two different things. So the implications for the couple, I think, you know, there's no debate there. Of course, if a couple has had unsuccessful treatment after two cycles of course the couple are going to want a third cycle provided they've been counselled appropriately and a third cycle would be in their best interest but that, that would always be understood. I'm talking more about the implications for the service provision because that's going to have an impact on everything that unit does and everything else the NHS can provide. So it, it's really, it's not saying that we don't want to do it. As I said earlier, we're all committed to providing the absolute best treatment for couples that we can. It's just saying that as the national group said from the outset, we need to understand what the implications of those changes are going to be. And that, that work has been started, so it, it, that will happen. This, this is where I don't, through you, Kandina, this is where I don't get it, right? We need to go to three, but you're saying, well, we have to look at that and the implications. So the implications is that a person who wants to go to three, and as far as we're concerned, this committee or, or this health service or, or, or this government want to go to three, 
But yes, I do understand there are implications on course, there are implications on uh, is the staff available, is the, 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 the basically everything there in order to move to three. But that's the point I don't get. Let me, uh, let we, me turn we, it round. You know, you're not, with the greatest respect to you, you're not clarifying why we can't well, well, can we give them the chance to do that, Do can Dr Lyle? I, ho I hope this might be helpful, but what I had, what I had in my head was in terms of implications mm -hmm. would be whether each health board had done some modelling work or was about to do some modelling work and what the knock-on consequences would be. For example, would moving to a third cycle for a couple already in the system mean a delay in a couple getting to their first cycle? and that kind yeah. of thing. So and is that modelling work taking yes, place? Yes, it is. That work is being done through liaison with ISD. And what, what I was going to say was that perhaps I could sort of turn the question around to you and say, suppose, suppose we say today, OK, for every couple that come to the assisted conception services, we will provide a third cycle for all couples who are deemed clinically eligible for that. And say we get, because we don't understand at the minute how many couples that's going to, to affect, we don't understand how many frozen transfers that's going to generate. So suppose we get 12 months down the line and we haven't changed anything about money into the service or staffing, we just provide the third cycle and we get 12 months down the line and our waiting times are back up to 24 months, what do we do then? We were told last week that... So, sorry, I, I, I need to say this. I'm just wondering whether we could get the views and, and, of what, the, the, what the consequences could be from the other health boards as well, because we've got four health boards there, and I, I promise you, I'm not trying to cut you off, I will let you back in with the okay. follow-up, but it's just to get a, a broad spectrum from across the country about what the, what the consequences or implications could be for moving to a third cycle in the near future. How close are you to teasing out uh, what that would mean in each area? So, I don't know... Uh, <coughs> Uh, Dr. Mashwari, perhaps? Um, um, I would support uh, Dr. Lyle's um, argument that nobody is saying that we shouldn't provide third cycle. We are all keen to provide, and with the NICE guidelines, that's what they say, that is optimum. However, the uh, implications of it has to be thought through, and planning has to be done. Now, the reason it is taking time, as I understand, because of the legality, the way data is put in, because of HFEA, which is our regulatory authority regulations. Data is just not available like that. Data has to be put in, and IST has to um, come in and help us to get the data across the board so that there is uniformity across all the four health boards, and we have equitable uh, distribution for IVF so that that waiting list remains the same, and we input into the service accordingly what the data comes out. I just want to give the opportunity to Dr. Kay and Dr. McKenzie. Do you want to add anything to that, Dr. Uh, Kay? We've done some data in Tayside looking at the number needing three cycles, and it's not a huge number, um, but I think we are looking at more in depth than that. But my understanding is if we were to provide it immediately, then you know within the same funding, other patients wouldn't get treatment. And I think it's deciding whether you'd increase your waiting list or who would be denied treatment. So it's not that we haven't got the capacity, but of course there's a funding issue. If we were to provide it, we couldn't provide treatment for other patients. Um, but, but I am clear we haven't got all the data we need to make decisions on this yet. And so ISD is going to be coming around shortly to generate more data so we can look at this in more depth. And we couldn't have had that data two, two years ago because things have changed hugely. Um, so success rates were freezing are better. Um, our care pathways are better. We're treating people quicker, younger, so success rates will be better. So I'm hoping that it'll be less people will need a three cycles than perhaps if we'd looked at this data when we started this process two or three years ago. OK, thank you, Dr. Lee. Dr. McKenzie? It, we're, we're waiting for the National Infertility Group, and we have members on, on that group. Um, the other important thing to see here, I think, is is understanding the, the published evidence as well. And the published evidence doesn't always make clear what it's talking about, whether it's talking about a cycle or a full cycle. And we we made that distinction earlier. And that that's important to understand. And the randomised control trials and, and published uh, evidence doesn't make that clear. So we're not exactly sure where we are. And the other thing to put into the into the equation is is the the potential for harm. Um, the potential for harm of going through that third ovarian stimulation 
is quite considerable. And we know that the, the couples who are going through that uh, have some of the poorest outcomes in terms of infertility outcomes. And so we've got to put that into the equation. That's a fundamental part of, of, of being a clinician, is to look at the, at, at the potential to minimise harm. OK, and then Richard Lyle, I did... I wrote about a supplement, but Richard did promise to let you back in. I wasn't here to cut you off. I just wanted to make sure all our witnesses get the opportunity to put their views on the record. Can I, I, as I say, at the end of the day, I'm not, I'm not getting it. You, you know, what you're doing. You're doing a, a very good job, but, but I really want to get to this situation of third cycle. If there's a reduction in the service, or a, a, if we have a hundred couples, even to uh, Dr. Vanessa Keith. If we have 100 couples, how many couples do you think need to go through a third cycle, in your experience? I think it'll probably be, le it'll be less than 20%. Yeah, and that, that, that's the point. So what we're saying is that 20%, if they were going for a third cycle, could actually affect the 80% who are starting their cycle. It within the same budget, yes. Yeah. So that, that's why we're not doing three cycles. Would you would you agree with that? I think I think, as Helen tried to explain, we, we need to understand what the cost implications are. So until we know the numbers, it, at the moment we're just guessing figures, aren't we? Uh, Richard, I, I think I think you've got your answers. Um, answers but and, and I think I think that maybe the one thing we, we should have asked was just time scale. So there's a lot of work going on. ISD modelling work, what the implications might be, looking at the figures, lots of new evidence. These things are always better. Or they take as long as they take. It's also quite good. Politicians love targets and timescales, don't we? So what do you think the timescale around that would be? Hoping for the end of 2015. Um, Sarah might be able to comment on the, the National Infertility Report. We were hoping for the end of 2015, weren't we? Yeah. So, 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 so that, that's helpful. And there was a supplementary in relation to that from Rhoda Grant as well. Yes, I just wanted to ask about harm. Um, obviously, any procedure has a risk yep. attached to it. But I got the impression from Dr. McKenzie that that risk increased with the number of cycles, so that there was maybe an increased risk with the third cycle. It would be good just to get an idea of what that was. No, I, I, I wasn't saying that it was an increased risk necessarily, but there is a risk. And that I'd, I'll pass on to, to um, specialist colleagues in, in a second. But any any risk c can be measured, and um, you would want to try and avoid that risk, which is, which is in, in large part why we introduced criteria around smoking, obesity, and other things. You're always working to reduce risk, and so that that's a very important part of the equation. Okay. Yeah. I see a supplementary from, from Dennis Robertson. Thank you for your patience, Dr. Simpson. Uh, De Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you very much, and my apologies to Dr. Simpson. Um, with regard to the risk, does this include psychological risk as opposed to just uh, a medical one, Dr. McKenzie? That, that is an important part of the equation for an individual couple, and I, I completely understand having seen complaints and having discussed this with, with clinicians in, in the Edinburgh Fertility Reproductive Endocrine Centre that some couples do become very distressed when they, when they hear that they haven't got any other, other opportunities for treatment um, through NHS funded cycles and that, that has to be added into the equation as well but actually an important part of counselling is to be open and honest about their chances and if, they, if their chances of, of success are very, very low, that has to be considered by the, by the couple as well in discussion with, with the clinicians and counsellor. Thank you. OK, is, and, and Dr Simpson, just in, indulge me just slightly. I just want to make sure, because doc, Dr McKenzie said he, he may seek some additional information from, from, from other specialists we have here in relation to harm. Does anyone want to add anything in relation to that before we move to Dr Simpson, Dr Lyle? I would probably just say, just to explain a little bit around the, the, the risk, the risk in terms of IVF is partly in, in the egg collection, um, which is very, a very small risk, but we always counsel patients that there's a risk of damaging blood vessel or bowel or infection. Um, there's also a risk of overstimulation, which we would counsel patients about. So they're the, the if you like, um, tangible medical risks they are small but they do exist and that's one of the reasons that we 
if possible, like to use frozen embryos before a further fresh cycle. So the enhanced ability to freeze is good because it means that it gives patients more opportunities to conceive without going through another fresh cycle. So that's a good thing. Um, and yes, I would agree, psychological risk is, is, is something that we do take very seriously. All units have a counselling service. All of the staff in the unit have had training in counselling and we're all very used to talking to patients through those difficult times. Is there anything to add to that before we move to Dr. Yeah, yes, Dr. Yeah. The, the risks of multiple pregnancy, and, and that's something that we've moved very much towards um, elective single embryo transfers. So I think all the units now have multiple pregnancy rates within guidelines of 10%. So there's much less risk of multiple pregnancy, but there still is a higher risk. So a natural chance of a twin pregnancy is about 1 in 80, but where we're looking around 10%, a multiple pregnancy carries um, higher risk maternally and for the, the children born from that. So that's something we also counsel patients about and that risk does go up as you, you get older so if you're looking at the third cycle often by the time they're having a third cycle the risks are slightly higher um, for that. Dr Maheshwari is there anything to no. Okay thank you. Dr Simpson thank you for your patience. It's okay I think we've clarified the third cycle business anyway at long last and it was very helpful Dr Mackenzie describing cycle and full cycle because I think that's something that we weren't we weren't clear on before. I've got two questions. One's technical, and that is I understand that actually the results from frozen embryos are better than fresh embryos, and I just wonder how that's going to affect things or whether it does affect things uh, uh, going forward. That's my first question, and my second question I'll maybe come back, if I may, it's a, uh, on counselling. But okay. I'll come yeah, I think we heard last week it so was emerging evidence in relation to um, uh, fr f um frozen embryos, any additional information you can provide us on how that, that, that's come along, Dr Mashwari? Okay, uh, I mean, um, in the terms of frozen embryo, there is emerging evidence that it may be better, but that's maybe, the evidence currently is based on three randomized controlled trials, which have got small numbers. One of them have been withdrawn because of methodological flaws. And there are two others. One is on hyper-responders, as Dr. Lyle mentioned, that if somebody is at a risk of hyperstimulation, that they produce lots of eggs, that can actually lead, is one of the causes of death when we are treating fit, young, healthy women. And our patient can go to ITU. I mean, it is associated with lots of risk, hyperstimulation, and we do everything to prevent it. And now there are strategies to prevent it much more than what there were previously. So out of the two trials which are left, one of them is on those patients which are hyper-responders, so that doesn't give you the norm. So that leaves with only one trial, which is small in number and doesn't provide enough evidence. But there is enough in the literature to say that frozen embryos use have improved, their success rate have improved as compared to what it was previously. However, Currently still, frozen is slightly less than fresh, and the main reason probably is the norm is that you select the best embryo to put in the fresh cycle, and it's only the second best which get frozen. So that is why we are doing a big randomized control trial, which NIHR HTA has provided 1.4 million funding for, which is going to start in this August, and Aberdeen is leading that trial, and I'm the chief investigator for that trial, uh, to compare in a randomized situation in 12 centers over the country whether if we do in a routine patients freezing all embryos and transfer fresh em frozen embryos two, three months later versus fresh embryo transfer, and our outcome we are looking at not only pregnancy rate, we are looking at healthy baby rate, which means term, singleton, life birth, which is appropriate weight for gestation. And we are going to look at the cost as well as the long-term societal cost in that. But that evidence will be there in 2020. That's very helpful. I just wanted Thank to you. get that clarified to get to sort of where we are with the going forward. Uh, can I just say also, I'm really very pleased that we've got a situation where when one, child, one partner has no genetic child, that that is not going to be a bar to having treatment now, I understand. So that will be immediately introduced, I presume, as it's on the record as saying one partner has no genetic child. As long as all further criteria are met by both partners, currently the criterion is that no child in the home, uh, and that's going to be stopped because it seemed to be quite unfair 
that if you had a couple who split up and one took custody and the other didn't, the one that didn't could actually, in their new relationship, get into treatment. The one who did take custody could not get into treatment. And that seemed the complete opposite of any sort of social justice. So I'm really delighted that that is now being eliminated. I, can you just confirm that is the case? Dr. Understanding from the National Fertility Group, that's something that's been looked at along with the third cycle as a criteria that we aspire to introducing, but we're requiring more data. And it's quite difficult to get that data because it's not easily available how many patients are not being referred because of that. Um, so it's not something that's being introduced immediately, no. Well, I'll just, just read it out for the record for the NSS report that we had. The group is keen to introduce the following criteria when affordable and suggests the 2015 review proposes a timescale for further assessment. So you're correct, it hasn't come in yet, but it says one partner has no genetic child as long as all further criteria are met by both partners. Currently, the criteria is there should be no child in the home. Yes. So it is being reviewed. I would urge that that be dealt with as quickly as possible because it seems to me to be the opposite of justice. It seems to me, and I, I hope my other committee members will agree in our report that we should do that. My second question, however, is about uh, counselling, uh, convener. Uh, when I sat on the infertility group back in 1987 and recommended two cycles for everybody in Scotland, and I'm glad we finally reached that almost 20 years on, um, one of the recommendations that I got into the report, because I was the GP and psychiatrist on that group as opposed to someone from an assisted conception unit, um, the, was that everyone should have a named individual to see them right through the process. Because my concern was that at that stage, I hardly met any couples who weren't depressed at some point in the, the thing. It's a very stressful process uh, going through, uh, you, you know, the, the whole the whole business. So. Do we have a? Uh, do you feel there's an adequate provision of funding to ensure uh, appropriate counselling and c continuity of support through the process? Okay. Who would like to comment on on counselling? Um, we, we, the side, we have a, um, a counsellor. Um, I think our current waiting lists are four to six weeks. Um, we allow patient, patients have information about that counsellor and certainly at review appointments encourage to see her if they feel that would help them. We also have nurses who provide and doctors who provide supportive counselling throughout the treatment but in answer to your question, patients do not have a named support person throughout their treatment. No. Okay, what's the situation elsewhere? Do um, Dr Maheshwari? Uh, in Grampian again we have a named counsellor who works within the unit and lot all of our nurses, we have a very stable uh, staffing situation, which is, we are very lucky about it. And all the nurses are being trained in the counseling and they attend regular courses. So they provide continuous support. Uh, and again, the counselor appointment is arranged both in Grampian as well as they go to Highlands as well to provide support. So patients do get within three to four weeks. Uh, and we encourage patients to have counseling even before the treatment, during the treatment, as well as post-treatment. We don't just leave it for post-treatment. So. Okay, Dr. McKenzie, do you want to? Yeah, we, we have a local counsellor in our centre, and um, the, 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 the information about that is, is provided in written documentation to the patients before they come to the unit and is offered verbally during the, the consultations as well, and that's throughout as well, in, in common with the other answers. Um, we also have information from the patient satisfaction survey about about the experience of using the counsellors. It, it's surprising, actually, um, that so, some couples who are offered it don't take it up. So that's something that we need to look at to make that a more attractive option for them, because I think they would benefit even if they don't think that they would themselves. Okay, Dr. Lau, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yes, we have a, a named counsellor who's been with us for a long time now. We recognise that can always do with more counselling provision and we're looking at the moment to appointing a second counsellor to add additional counselling hours. We have a system whereby patients can self-refer or if they're uncomfortable about that we can refer directly um, but it's very open access and also we have support from nursing staff and uh, medical staff as with the other centres. The question of continuity wasn't really fully addressed uh, with I mean, do, do, you know, it seems to me that in this particular sphere, I mean, it's, it's important in every sphere of medicine, but in this particular sphere, for example, if you have w w one nurse, is it possible to actually have the same nurse providing that support, particularly in Grampian, you've got them trained in counselling now, 
you know, to have that person that you know you can ring up, you can make contact to, this with the new system of effectively partnership in medicine instead of uh, an uneven partnership, it's become much more even. Have we got that sort of, are you happy that we've got enough resource to provide that sort of level of continuity? Dr. McKenzie? I would need to go back and ask the, the, the centre about that. I, uh, I'm not sure, but you're absolutely right that that is what we should be providing. It, uh, provi we provide that, for example, in maternity care. Um, yes. uh, the, the, the same midwife is the aspiration throughout, yes. and we, we generally meet that. Um, so you're quite right. Okay, would, would some other witnesses like to comment on the stability of the, the nursing and staffing rota at, at, at the units to provide that continuity? Um, some of our nursing staff are part-time and obviously people take holidays. So I find it difficult to see how you can provide one named person throughout. Um, we have patients who we do try and support with the same nurse where they form a good rapport. Um, it would be quite difficult to achieve throughout, so it's not something we've looked at. Um, and yes, we'd have resource implications if we were to introduce that. Dr. Maheshwari? We do try, I mean, we're a small group, and we do try that same person see them, but it can't be possible 100% of the times. So that's really fine. But, the, but the, as Dr. McKenzie pointed, I'd just like to point that even if we are recommending counseling to the patients, they see the label of counseling. Counseling probably is not the right word. We need to invent another word because they don't see that they need counseling despite the fact we advise them this is not this is for their benefit and whatever. So I think that name needs to be Okay, Dr. Lyle, oh, my apologies, I didn't mean to cut you off. Dr. No, no, Sorry. Right. Um, Dr. Lyle, do you want to add <coughs> Excuse me, I, I agree with Abba that, I mean, often if I'm suggesting counselling to a couple, I would tend to say that, you know, I would actually highlight the fact that counselling is perhaps not the right word and, and I explain that our counsellor is very much somebody who is just a very good listening ear who can discuss the issues with them and that seems to sit a bit better sometimes with couples. In terms of um, named nurse support, we've tried various permutations over the years and have, a, have found exactly the same challenges as, as Vanessa articulated, which is a large number of the nurses work part-time. But as far as we can, we do try to do that, um, you know, recognising that patients often do develop a rapport with, with one nurse more than another. But as far as we can, we try. No one can provide 100% 365 one person care. The days when that happened with GPs has even gone. <coughs> I mean, we used to, but it's gone. Um, so I understand that. But if it is an aspiration to meet that as far as possible, it actually helps to reduce the need for formal counselling. So I very much welcome that. Thank so you. Now, can, I, can I just ask a brief supplementary on that my, my, myself, actually? Because uh, was it Dr. Kay that spoke about? Try to train frontline nursing staff and counselling. Also, oh, also yourself, Dr. Mashwari. The, the reason for asking that is because it's about, and we heard it from, I think it was Dr. McKenzie mentioned the patient satisfaction survey. I'm just wondering in terms of like a, any front saving facing health service, the culture is very important, and the empathy and the bonds and the, the interpersonal skills that the all frontline staff, be it receptionist or nursing staff, is is there. Is there any kind of um, evidence into how do you measure satisfaction? I mean, I, I understand you're not satisfied if you if you don't get the child you're looking for, but uh, you know the human touch goes a long way to easing a lot of that pressure and strain, even if it's not formal counselling. So, the culture in the assisted conception units, how how do you foster a kind of positive culture? I'm sure you do, but it's maybe just an opportunity to put some of that on the record. Well, we recently, within the last couple of weeks only, had the survey report published, um, through, which was done through NHS Grampian. Um, and one of the uh, people from the patient safety group came in and interviewed some of the patients and some of the staff as well, in a different times of the day for different clinics, because we run uh, clinics for people who are having difficulty in conceiving, adolescent clinic, all in the same setup. And um, they talked about the reception staff, they talked about the nursing staff, they talked about the doctors they see, and it was very, very positive, which was very positive for the team. And that survey got fed back to team because it was immediate feedback, and then they, obviously, it gets reinforced and they try to provide it better. So it's just the uh, getting that culture of providing feedback, immediate feedback, and 
it's not only the negative feedback that gets provided, it's the positive feedback. And most places, I think, are doing now the improvement tree, the tree that what we did better and what, what we can improve on, and you say we did kind of stuff, so that patients also see that whatever they see, they say we also um, act on that. Yeah, I'm glad I actually got there with my supplementary. It took me a while to get to the point I was trying to make, but that gave you the opportunity to put that on the record. Do you think any of other witnesses would like to say something, Dr Lyle? Yes, similarly, we... Um we have a, a suggestions box in our unit and use that similarly. But also it's probably worth saying that all the units are licensed by the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority. And as part of that inspection process, we have to do a patient satisfaction questionnaire. And the results of that are always fed back. And like Aberdeen, um, certainly when we had our last inspection, um, the results were very positive. Good. And opportunity, Dr. K, Dr. McKenzie, you don't have to say something, but you're welcome to. I think very much what Helen's saying. I mean, we, we're inspected regularly, we do patient satisfaction surveys, and in general, compared to other departments I work, work in within obstetrics and gynaecology, I think infertility is a very supportive environment. We have a small group of um, staff, so patients do get to know us. I think we all work in the field because we, we're passionate about providing fertility care, so I think we do very well, and I see that in our satisfaction surveys. We will always get patients who aren't happy, and we take that on board and uh, constantly trying to improve our service. And Dr McKenzie? I, I, I would echo what's been said before. Um, I'm, I'm always very impressed by the, by the dedication and long experience of the staff that, that we have in our unit. The one thing that I, I would point out, though, is that I don't know that, that patients who are coming to, to or, or thinking about coming to see us would know that from, from looking at our website and, and trying to unpick what our service is like. Um, I, do, I don't think that the, that the NHS is particularly good at, at, at using modern technology to, to show what, what the staff do and what the centre is like, which I think is a pity. And we, we see that reflected when we meet people, for example, through complaints. Um, if we meet somebody through a complaint who, who is unhappy with access to service and they actually meet the staff, they, they, they're often um, really very impressed, but they, they, haven't, they haven't had a chance to talk to them about, about things because um, they haven't actually accessed the service yet. So I think we need to get better at that side of things. That's very helpful, Dr McKenzie. Um, I think the final question we have uh, from committee members, I don't see any other bids, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Rhoda Grant. Oh, and OK, Rhoda Grant, followed by two more questions. Yes. Uh, can I just um, ask about a topic we covered last week about um, self-funding patients and the impact um, that that um, income to the units has? Does that allow you to treat more people? Are you dependent on that income? Any takers on that? This is the first question where witnesses have not been very, very keen. <laughs> Dr Lyle. Um, we have a very, very small number of self-funding patients in Glasgow. The, the vast majority of our service is NHS funded. <coughs> we do about 1,000 cycles of treatment in Glasgow and about 75 are self-funders. Um, they are managed through the University of Glasgow and it's slightly different to the, the situation in the other centres, which I'm sure we'll be able to explain to you. Um, but in Glasgow, the money generated um, by the self-funding service goes back into the university. So the NHS service is not dependent on that for its provision of service. And there's no impact on, or very little impact on capacity in terms of um, numbers of cycles, because it's so small. Same as Dr. Lyle, uh, the number of self-funding patients is much less because a, the criteria, is, uh, the waiting list has come down, which has helped more people to access NHS-funded cycles. Um, and uh, our unit is slightly different, that uh, the assisted conception unit particularly is under the umbrella of University of Aberdeen, and that's a joint partnership between NHS Grampian and University of Aberdeen. So any self-funded patients go through the University of Aberdeen payment system, and that has no impact on our ability to provide when the NHS-funded patient is ready to be provided with them, because we have enough staff to provide enough number of cycle. So that doesn't delay NHS-funded patient. And another point I would like to mention here is, Grampian is probably the only place where there is no separate private unit so everybody from the Grampian comes to Grampian and northeast of Scotland comes to the 
Aberdeen Center of Reproductive Medicine, and uh, none of our consultants do, uh, who works in the reproductive medicine do any private practice at all. And so if patients were to go for a private center or elsewhere, then it's not convenient for patients to travel that far as well. So that's why we provide that service for who don't fulfill the NHS criteria currently. Okay, the doctor here, Dr. McKenzie, is yes. anything to add? In Dundee, it's all within the NHS. Um, the number of private um, self-funded patients has gone down significantly with the new criteria, but I think it's around 15% at the moment. Um, the the self-funded patients don't affect access for the NHS. I think by having self-funded, it does improve the service, though. It's given us stability over the years. In the past, it was about 50% self-funded, so it gives us um, security in terms of staff funding. Um, it's not done deliberately to income generate, but does on the whole um, income generate, and I suspect that that does support the NHS service we provide as well. Um, so, so I think it works well because we have self-funded patients within our service. Um, we don't have a private IVF centre in, in Tayside either. Um, I, I was quite opposed to the idea of self-funding when I first took up this post seven or eight years ago, but I've been I've been persuaded by discussing with with colleagues that it's actually a good thing to do. Um, it, it it meant that we had the unit um, in the first place twenty five years or so ago. That it, it was it was formed on that principle. Um, we do much less. As a, as a proportion self-funding than we ever used to for the reasons that we've described just, that we've heard just now um, there is one further point I'd like to make though and that is that um, it allows us to to provide um, treatment for siblings as well well to, 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 to produce siblings um, a, a couple who who has has appreciated the, the staff input and the centers input throughout their first pregnancy can then self-fund. Um, for a sibling, and that that provides that continuity that we were describing just now, so that that's another positive I think of having a self a self funded part. But again, in Lothian, it is completely separate. We have a, a certain number of allocated NHS funded cycles, and the self funding cycles do not get in the way of that. Can I ask that just raises a question in my mind, which I hadn't been thinking of previously. Um, if someone has frozen embryos and has had a successful pregnancy, um. Can they finish that cycle, that complete cycle, to have a sibling? That that's a good question. Um, it's a question that we have have had referred to to us before. Um, I, I I can't tell you the detail. Actually, I, I'm I'm embarrassed to say I can go back and ask about that. But it would make sense that that was an option, an op, an, op, an option there. Um, but I would have to ask the unit. Dr. Lyle, could you provide a bit more information on that? Yes. If someone has had a live birth, then they would have to self-fund any subsequent frozen transfers. And perhaps the easiest way to explain that is that after every treatment episode, the criteria are reapplied. So if someone has had a live birth, they then wouldn't be eligible for further NHS-funded treatment. Can I ask what the difference in cost would be for, for example, if someone was going for a third cycle as a self-funder or going to complete a cycle for a sibling as a self-funder, is there a difference in cost to them? Do you mean the difference between a fresh and a frozen cycle, or do you mean...? The, yeah. Yes, basically, the difference between a third cycle, a full. totally full third cycle, or having embryos left over from the second oh, cycle okay. um, yeah. So if they'd as, par as part of a second child, if you understand. Yes. So if they'd had a, if they'd had a baby from a fresh cycle mm -hmm. in the NHS, but had generated frozen embryos in the NHS, and then came to use those uh, in a self-funding unit, this is a ballpark figure. Um, frozen embryo transfer, I think, is around about eight hundred nine hundred pounds against a, a fresh cycle, which is probably between about three and four thousand pounds. So there's quite a, quite a, a difference in cost. But that's a, that's very much a ballpark figure. Can I just say, uh, Dr. McKenzie had indicated he wanted to ask something. It, it wasn't to ask; it was to actually say that my my previous answer it wasn't clear. Um, it, that it's exactly the same as as uh, Dr. Lyle's answer that we we certainly wouldn't um, provide NHS funding for that 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 sibling. Um, 
but I, the, my, my point was that I, I don't know the process for the couple actually accessing that that, that frozen embryo um, for self-funding, but I, I think that they can access that that that, that frozen embryo for self-funded um, treatment for the sibling. Okay. Okay. You you can after Colin Keir, who's already got my attention for a supplementary, yes. Thanks, convener. Um, it was actually on the back of um, some of the questions that we've just heard. And in terms of the those who put themselves forward for self-funded uh, uh, treatment, in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is, do we have an idea of the people who are actually putting themselves forward? Is it a case of um, maybe in the past it's been the length of the waiting times they, they've been uh, heading, you know, decided they wanted to self fund because of that? Or do we have a situation these days, given the fact that waiting times have come down, as you said, said earlier, that um, we have a situation where perhaps they've gone through two cycles already and perhaps been uh, um, maybe the, the, the discussion that's taking place between patient and and the service is that a third cycle is not appropriate. Is, is there the element of a desperation type aspect to self-fund after that? Do we have an idea of these people who are going through to self-funding? Now, just before so someone asks that, if someone answers that, because time is short, if I see nodding heads from the other witnesses, I might not take in a second witness for comments. And my apologies for that. So, Dr. K. Yes, there has been a big change. When our waiting lists were, for example, from Fourth Valley for four years, 50% of our patients were self-funded, and the main reason was because of the long time to wait. And you can understand that's particularly important if you're older because success rates go down. So the difference in treating somebody at 38 compared to 42 is huge. So we had a lot of self-funders because of the long waiting lists. Now most of our self-funders are because they don't fit the NHS criteria. So it may be regarding the current rules of the child in their home or their age, or their BMI, or smoking, so it's because they don't fit the criteria. I can't give you figures, but my feeling is it'd be a small number, uh, the desperate ones who, who go on to have a, a third cycle, but there will be some in that group. Now, I, I'm going to give um, my colleagues a, a name check for them who's coming in. So I've got supplementaries from the net, and then Richard Simpson, but I've also got Dennis Robertson and Richard Lyle on a list, and that will definitely be it. So my apologies if... If I ask you to keep your questions short, but time is upon us. But Nanette Mill, I don't think, has had an opportunity yeah. to ask a question. It, it, it is a short question at the back of Rhoda Grant's comments. How long do you keep frozen embryos? Them for uh, HFE allows us to keep them for 10 years and for 55 years for people who are going to be prematurely infertile so that we are doing for fertility preservation. But we ask them to be uh, sign the consents again after 10 years and a medically qualified practitioners have to justify why they are in storage for more than 10 years. But patient can choose to uh, do it for less time, but uh, they are allowed for 10 years. So patients can, could access those embryos at any time within the time they're preserved? Provided all of the criteria yeah, sure, are fulfilled sure. and it's safe to have a child for yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, the net, Richard Simpson. Was partly that question and adding on who funds that bit, the retention, or is there any cost involved? For NHS funded cycle, it is funded by NHS. Uh, even if you have one child, the frozen embryos are fu where freezing is funded by NHS, but they, when they come to use it, as we've heard, that is. I'm sorry, by. I missed that. I didn't. The last Freezing of embryos for NHS funded cycle is funded by NHS. Yes. And um, for those who are self-funding their treatment, they have to fund the freezing. Right, but if, if you've had a child, you've got some frozen embryos left over, and you're going to retain them thinking about self-funding for a second child, who, who's paying for that freeze, freezing, retention and freezing, or is there no real cost involved? Or? There are costs involved, but currently um, it is being funded by NHS. But when they come to use it, the preparation and all the uh, procedure would involved in scan would be self uh, Dr. Lyle, could you add to that? I think that's a very pertinent question because I think certainly in, in many units the answer is there is no funding for that storage. And it does incur um, staff time. There is an audit process that has to be gone through regularly for the HFEA and just for general clinical governance. 
there also is a huge administrative workload in terms of maintaining contact with these patients to find out their wishes regarding the embryos. And I think part of the problem here is that there was a, a cost assigned to a cycle of IVF many, many years ago. Um, and it has never really been revised. And of course, it's difficult to do. And as and it goes back to a lot of the things we've said earlier, that as freezing techniques have improved, more freezing is happening, <coughs> all of these things have a knock-on effect. But it, it has been absorbed, but there is no defined funding mechanism for it. Oh. Apologies for just sneaking in a quick question of my own here. Is it a bit complex in relation to what the costs are? Because if, if a, a cycle is now... Um, not just a fresh embryo transfer, but also a uh, frozen embryo transfer, that's less costly than a second fresh cycle with all the med medicines that involve. So is there swings and roundabouts in terms of where the, the costs come in? Well, in a way, but if you've got, you know, if you say previously you costed for a fresh cycle, for, for a fresh transfer, say, but now that cycle is encompassing fresh and frozen, You've got the cost of the freezing, the cost of the storage, the cost of the embryology staff, the cost of the admin staff. So it's all of those things which have never really been factored into the equation. That's something that we have to be teased out Correct. going forward, particularly before we go to the consequences of third cycles Correct. and that kind of thing. I've seen lots, lots of nodding heads there. Um, thank you for putting that on the record. I think that's helpful and a helpful supplementary from Richard Simpson as well. Dennis Robertson. Thank you very much, convener, and I'll, I'll try and be very brief. Uh, we've discussed, obviously, the uh, situation around uh, infertility in that process. I'm just wondering if there's a recognised genetic hereditary condition um, and the couples are saying they want to avoid passing that on to um, the, 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 new, the new baby, hopefully, um, is the same process used? I mean, I know you can have AID, artificial insemination by donor. Um, would you be applying the same sort of criteria in the process? It's obviously the same clinic, um, but there might not be any stimulation, or would there be a stimulation from the woman in terms of the uh, the, the, the eggs to try and ensure there was a, a impregnation? Uh, Dr. Lyle, could you? Um, the process you're referring to is um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and we run the national service for that in Glasgow. It's funded by NSD, who fund 30 cycles annually, that service. It, I'll try and be brief. In, in brief, the couples go through a cycle of IVF or ICSI, the embryos are created, and then um, a, a cell is taken from the embryo and tested either for the defective usually for the de defective gene or for any um, chromosome rearrangement which may be implicated in the problem. Um, in answer to your question, yes, the um, same criteria are applied to both services. Mm. But there's also another way of doing that is the uh, insemination by donor. Um, if, say, the woman doesn't have a genetic or hereditary condition but, say, it's the male, so he doesn't want to pass on that condition you know, obviously by the impregnation of his sperm, they can do it by donor? Well, ideally, you would, you would still, as long as the man was producing sperm, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis would still be appropriate because it's the embryo you're testing. So you're right, um, donor treatment is a possible route, but for couples to achieve a genetic child, which is, um, is what most couples would aspire to, then whether the problem was either on the male side or the female side, PGD would still be, in defined circumstances, would still be appropriate. Okay, oh, thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that. I would just take the final, unless any other witness wants in on that, we'll just go straight to the final question, if that, that's okay. Excellent, okay. Uh, Richard Lyle, you have the last question. Thank you, Kirina. In your medical opinion, when do you think that every NHS health board will reach and be able to give three cycles? <laughs> I, oh, no, oh, I, th I think when, um, when the evidence has been gathered, which hopefully will have been done by the end of this year, and everybody is able to take stock of that, then they'll be able to make a reasoned decision whether that's something which they can provide or can't provide. But underpinning that is that the aspiration would be from all of us that we give couples the best chance possible. Can I, uh, Richard Lyle, perhaps try and be helpful by saying that once 
you have that more information analysed by the end of the year, do you think you will then be in a position to put a time frame around when we could move to a third cycle? So, OK, December 2015 is not, not a deadline, but once we get to the start of 2016, would you expect a time frame to emerge from the national strategy? Again, I think it's difficult to answer that definitively, but I would expect what would happen is once the evidence is available, then boards will need the opportunity to consider the implications of that, and I guess they would be in more of a position to let you know the time scale around that than than we would be. Maybe that's something we can take up early twenty sixteen, Richard. We can have a look at that. But th th thank you very much for that. Um, c can I just? Uh, we are over time, but given the fact we've been asking all the questions, um, is there anything that any of our witnesses would like to just to put on the record, just so it, it's there um, in the public domain, just before we we close this public session? I'd just like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you. I think it's really helpful to try and make this difficult process clearer to you. So thank you. Okay, well, well, can, well there, can I therefore um, thank all of you for taking the time this morning to... Um, oh, right, m my clerk will keep me right. We're, we're conscious that it's um, four boards we've, we've got here today. I think we're, we're keen perhaps to write to each of the other health boards and just find out what the situation is, uh, ask them to reflect on the evidence that they've, they've heard today. And I think we're just keen to, to put that on record in the public session so that for anyone following the evidence sessions here, they would know what, what some of our next steps are in relation to that. So thank you for keeping me right there. But uh, as, as, as I was saying, uh, can I thank all of you for taking the time to, to give pretty detailed and expert evidence today. And on a personal level, can I thank you very much for the work that you do and, and I know bringing a lot of happiness to, to, to families right across across Scotland. And I know my colleagues in the committee would like to do like like to do likewise so thank you again for your your, your time this morning and uh, we close this item of the agenda and we move into private session thank you